Hey folks, Scott Weingart here, and this is the MCRIT Podcast. Today, one of the lectures from the Essentials of MCRIT course. This is Tom DeLore talking about the diagnosis and differentiation of TTP and DIC. One of my favorite lectures, well actually they were all pretty friggin' amazing, but this one taught me a lot from the conference. Now, if you want to hear more of these lectures, then go to the Essentials of Emergency Medicine site and you could buy all of the lectures from that day, but they were nice enough to let us put Tom's two lectures here on the MCRIT site for all of you to enjoy. Later in the week, we'll post each second lecture, which is on treatment of TTP and DIC, so look forward to that. Without any further ado, Tom DeLore, hematologist extraordinaire on thrombocytopenia in the critically ill patient. I have no relevant financial disclosures. Uh, people offended by the joke can email me. Um, so there's a lot of things that can cause thrombocytopenia. I would love to spend the rest of the day telling you about all of them because I think they're great. But one thing I always do when I approach a patient or I get called and consult a patient with thrombocytopenia is I ask myself, are they sick? Because there's a lot of passenger thrombocytopenia, things I don't worry about. But the two biggest things I always worry about, I get consulted about, are TTP and DIC. So let's demystify these uh, terms. So for TTP is a disease of platelets. And to help me, I have Mr. Angry Platelet here. And then for DIC, it's actually diseases, we'll talk about a thrombin generation, which I realize brings back bad medical school memories. And we'll go a little bit through that. So TTP is a disease of platelets. And remember, platelets are the cells that we normally have that <clears throat> glom together, form the initial platelet plug, and provide primary hemostasis. So TTP is a disease of overactive platelets. What happens is your platelets literally start to spontaneously to aggregate, to clump up in every little vessel. And this is really what causes the pathophysiology of TTP. You get little platelet clumps in your heart, in your kidney, in your uh, pancreas, in your brain. And so that's why there's often a variety of wide clinical presentations, because these little platelets clumping together leading to end organ damage. Now, what's responsible for this is a strange and mysterious protein called Adams TS13. And this is a protein that, whose lack of leads to TTP. And to really try to summarize it quickly, TTP in platelet aggregation, you have this glue called von Willebrand's factor. And the glue is very sticky. And you don't want sticky glue all the time in your body because you just literally turn into Gumby. It's actually where the idea came from. And so, uh, this Adams TS13 helps normally to keep your platelets, uh, to keep the von Willebrandts in the unsticky form. You, you lose Adams TS13 either due to autoimmune, maybe you weren't born with it, boom, your platelets start aggregating everywhere. So really, TTP is due to a very specific issue of missing this protein called Adams TS13. And it's the primary problem. TTP is disease. It's a disease that we call TTP. And so it's when people present with this, this is their main issue. It's not secondary most often to any other thing. So platelet aggregation due to eventually to missing Adams TS13, and it's the primary problem. Well, what about DIC? Well, DIC is an issue with our friend thrombin here, a key protein of coagulation. And so in DIC, we see increased thrombin generation. Now, why does that matter? Who cares? It's a protein. Well, thrombin is a pivotal molecule of coagulation. In fact, I once had a cat named thrombin. Uh, <clears throat> yes, my daughter Fibrinogen always played with it. So anyway. Um, <clears throat> but what thrombin does is it's a powerful positive feedback. It activates factor V, factor VIII, factor XIII. It cleaves fibrinogen to form a clot. It stimulates fibrinolysis. It activates platelets. Thrombin's the master molecule of coagulation. And so what happens is you get excess generation of thrombin, and this leads to overactivation of coagulation. So if you imagine everything thrombin is doing normally, imagine a bunch of thrombin running around, coughing up hairballs, doing all this stuff. So you get factor depletion, you cleave fibrinogen, you get thrombosis, but you get this powerful stimulation of fibrinolysis. So you get this tremendous secondary fibrinolysis leading to bleeding, clot breakdown, you get activation of platelets,
but this activation of platelets actually leads to thrombocytopenia. So what goes on in uh, DIC is this powerful stimulus for coagulation over activation of thrombin leading to factor destruction. So that's why most people with this bleed. <clears throat> also get this stimulation of fibrinolysis, which aggravates the bleeding. Now there's very rare forms of DIC where we don't see this secondary fibrinolysis, but it's usually cancer or other obvious things. So this is why patients bleed, and this is why their labs are deranged. <clears throat> and so uh, this is a molecular modeling idea, but this kind of shows the pathophysiology of uh, DIC, overactivation of thrombin. Now another key point is DIC is always secondary to something else. It's, there's probably rare primary DIC syndromes, but really it's always secondary to other things. And you know, I always see these you know, causes of DIC. Well, really, anything that generates too much thrombin will cause DIC. Get hit by a truck, you expose tissue factor, you get coagulation, you get DIC. You have an obstetrical disaster, you stimulate tissue factor, you stimulate thrombin generation, you get DIC. You get septic, you get the idea. So really, anything that really upsets the system enough will lead to DIC. So it's really always secondary to something else. Now again, it may be the primary manifestation, you know, somebody's septic and they're bleeding everywhere, but it's because that something else is driving this excess thrombin generation. So how do we diagnose TTP? So, you know, people learn about pentads, quadrangles, pentagrams, other things. But the key is what I like to call the terrible triad of TTP. And when I think about TTP, I look for three things. One, microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. It's a great phrase, it makes me sound smart because it rolls off my tongue, but really that is the combination of schistocytes and high LDH. So you got all these little platelet aggregates, bam, 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 forming everywhere. Your red cells come steaming along, whack, they hit this platelet aggregate and it splits in half. It gets red cell fragmentation. So it's what we call schistocytes. And uh, there's a little helmet cell in the middle of the picture here. So that's one of the things I look for when I diagnose TTP or schistocytes. Now, again, I look for this by, like everybody else does, reading the lab report. So you'll see one plus schistocytes, two plus. If you're really worried about it, call the lab tech, they'll tell you. But a lot of things can lead to schistocytes. You can actually see it in DIC. You can uh, see it in heart valves. The other thing I look for is a very high LDH. It's L as we remember, an LDH is marker of red cell destruction. But the other thing that the LDH is a marker of is end organ damage. And it's actually very interesting in DIC, most of the LDH is tissue LDH. It's coming from end organ damage. And the LDH is usually sky high, two to three to four times normal. And that's one of my key tests. Um, when I'm called by the fellow, uh, when I call by the ICU at night and they're asking me, I'm really worried this patient has TTP, I go, what's the LDH? I call that my putting on the socks test because if the LDH is sky high, I put on my socks, I walk over the phone, and I call the fellow to go in and work up the patient. <laughs> and so, so I, I think an LDH is pretty key. It's often not part of routine labs, but that's usually a red flag to me, an LDH very high. So I like the microangiopathic chemolytic anemia, schistocytes, LDH. Thrombocytopenia, again, can be mild, sometimes 10 to 20,000, yeah, you know, people are thinking about it, but a lot of times, especially early TTP, it's 50 or 60, it's kind of that milieu of general illness, so you kind of always got to think TTP. Finally, end organ damage. Now, we used to teach the fever, the renal failure, encephalopathy, but I've seen pancreatitis, I've seen ARDS. The most common cause of death in TTP is cardiac. So really, any organ that has blood flowing through it uh, that can be blocked by platelet aggregates is gonna be damaged in TTP. So again, these are the things I think about in TTP. And kind of the rule of thumb I give is you just kind of always have to think about, you know, could this be TTP? No, nah, they just got run over by a truck. But at least, at least if you think about it, it'll keep you from getting burned. And again, part of it is I think we don't routinely do LDHs and sometimes can be a good uh, tip for this. Well, what about DIC? Another phrase I've heard DIC called instead of disseminated intervascular coagulation is diseased-induced coagulopathy. Because again, we have a disease process 
inducing coagulopathy. So I think part of the diagnosis is, is something going on with the patient to induce this disease-induced coagulopathy and lead to having uh, DIC. Now, like you, we all remember the coagulation cascade. I'm going to spend the next hour uh, going every, over every particle of this. Well, think about thrombin just running through and just ripping all of this up. So kind of thrombin running amok. And that's how I think about diagnosing DIC. Again, there's not a DIC test. Like, yes, they have DIC. No, they haven't. You know, people have invented scoring systems. But again, it's a clinical diagnosis, but really marked by coagulopathy. And so the INR is up. That makes sense. You're depleting coagulation factors. You're depleting fibrinogen. Platelets are falling because they're being consumed. That, that is often a good test, especially it's under 50,000. But again, as we know, a lot of things can cause the platelets to fall. The PTT goes up sometimes very markedly. You're knocking out factor seven, you're knocking out factor eight, uh, you're knocking out all the quag factors. A key factor that doesn't get much attention is fibrinogen. Fibrinogen is important for several reasons. One, it makes a clot. You need fibrinogen to bind together to make clots. So no fibrinogen, no clots. Another thing fibrinogen does is a little bit more subtle. It's actually the endpoint of our coagulation re reactions. So if you do a PTT, you do an INR in the lab, the endpoint's a clot. Well, you have no fibrinogen, there's no clot. So sometimes you'll get labs back saying the INR is infinite, the PTT is under 200, and you'll actually discover the fibrinogen's 30. So, so sometimes that can also throw off laboratory tests. And again, fibrinogen we tend often not to get, but it's a key thing when I'm worrying about it. Because if the fibrinogen's low, that's a marker of very bad DIC. And so uh, really needs intervention. Finally, another test we do is the D-dimer. Now, the D-dimer is, uh, again, I know notorious. Everybody breaks out in a sweat. Oh, he's going to start talking about pulmonary embolism. My God, he's supposed to talk about DIC. But remember that uh, the D-dimer was originally developed as a test for DIC. Because what happens in DIC is that you make too much thrombin. Thrombin hooks together and converts fibrinogen into fibrin clots, big strong bonds here. Factor 13 comes along and arc welds it together. And it turns out that bond factor 13 makes can't be broken down. And so when that clot breaks down, you increase something called D-dimers. And D-dimers actually was a great test for DIC. Because if you had sky-high levels of D-dimer, that kind of told you the whole picture. You had too much thrombin generation, you made too much fibrin clot, and then the excess secondary fibrinolysis broke it all down. And so D-dimers were sky high. The problem I'm running into now is a lot of labs have tweaked their D-dimers for DVT diagnoses, PE diagnoses, and now we're kind of dealing with the lower limits of normal. Oh, is the D-dimer above 500? It's a slightly up. Whereas in DIC, the D-dimer is like 15,000, 20,000. So sometimes it's lost a little bit of its sense of its specificity because many labs only report slightly high D-dimers. So if you got a sky high D-dimer in the thousand, that's great. But I'm finding this a little bit more difficult to use in many labs. So to me, when I'm really worried about DIC, again, it's the whole picture. You know, a patient who's bleeding, they have a coagulopathy, high INR, high PTT, low platelets, fibrinogen I really focus in on, and then a D-dimer being up. So if we think about the two diseases I just talked about, <clears throat> TTP is really a disease of overactive platelets. Diagnosis is the terrible triad, uh, microangiopathic chemolytic anemia, high LDH, uh, end organ damage, thrombocytopenia. Now, you're saying, well, why not just order an Adams TS-13? You just spent minutes telling us about it. The problem is the turnaround time's too long. In my lab, it takes 12 days. You know, that's great. By the time it's back, I'll know from the autopsy or not if the patient had TTP or not. And again, it's very helpful for me to know the level, but, down, but that's a down-the-road thing. You don't have the luxury. So I send it off. I wait for it but it's a clinical diagnosis. As my mentor used to say, Tom, you know it in your gut. And I'm always like, well, what if I just ate a bad burrito? So uh, it's something you should think about. DIC, remember, it's overactive thrombin. 
leading to excess activation of coagulation. So again, a lot of disease states we see, sepsis, trauma, OB disasters, snake bites, uh, scorpion stings, will lead to overactive coagulation. And then where we see it is derangement of coagulation tests. So low fibrinogen, high PT, PTT, uh, low levels of thrombin, and very high levels of D-dimer. So that's kind of my little of what I think about and what causes and how I detect TTP and DIC. Thank you. <laughs> Amazing. Okay. Amazing. Now, the most burning question I have is, are, are you just putting on your socks to commiserate with your fellow who has to come in? Like, what, <laughs> what, 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 what does the putting on the socks do for you when, right. uh, when you get that call? That's right. My floors are cold. I don't want to walk on the floor <laughs> in bare feet. It's Oregon. It's cold. <laughs> All right. You've given us a pretty good paradigm to differentiate between uh, TTP and DIC. Yes. How do you differentiate TTP from just they're really sick and have critical illness? That's a good question. So I think for me, there's several things from being really sick. One, a lot of patients I see who are just really sick tend not to have very sky high LDHs. Now, again, you can get burned in liver disease and other situations, but that, that's usually pretty unusual. Secondly, uh, it's the variety and changing of in-organ manifestations. So patients can be encephalopathic one minute, they wake up well the next. Uh, the renal disease is often fleeting. And so those are the things I factor in. Again, sometimes that's where the Adams TS-13 does help because it can be a tough call on some patients. I do treat some patients for it and discover I was wrong. But I think in general, I look for the LDH, uh, the terrible triad, the patterns uh, to help me differentiate. What our hematologists have told us, we had a patient, we were all excited about TTB. We felt great. And like when you get one, you're like, oh, I finally found yeah. it. And then they're like, well, there are no schistocytes. It's not TTP. Mm. Is that true? The absence of schistocytes rules it out? It almost always rules it out. Again, there's case reports, ports, but to me, it almost always rules it out. Because to me, it's a reflection of the pathophysiology. Uh, unless for some reason they didn't have a blood pressure, uh, there should be platelets being destroyed by the platelet, uh, by red cells destroyed by the platelet aggregate. All right, so that's fantastic. So if you think it's TTP, you ask for a peripheral smear, yeah. there's no, no schistocytes. Yeah. Okay, that's great. You're done. Okay, how high, you mentioned the LDH, uh, what are you really looking for? What number makes you think, hmm, TTP? So our, our upper range of normal uh, is 206, so 207. Now, uh, our upper range of normal is 206, so I usually think about 500, 600. It's sky high. Uh, sometimes we often see it in the thousands. So I, like I said, it's often surprising because the patient doesn't look like that sick and they have this ginormous elevation. So differentiation between TTP and DIC, if the coags are normal? Yes. Not, not, not TTP. Not TTP. I mean, not, not DIC, right? Not, yeah, no, yes, no, we're, no, no, we're getting me. dangerous. I know, it's my fault. That's, that's true. Not DIC right. at that point. Not DIC. So, so it is markedly unusual to see abnormal coag tests. So that's another differentiator. All right, and you mentioned the fibrinogen and the D-dimer. Yes. What kind of levels are we looking for on the fibrinogen? So fibrinogen, nor upper range of normal is 500. I'm sorry, 150. Usually in sick people, it's higher. So I really worry if it's under one, under 150, and especially under 100. All right, and just so you folks are aware, the treatment of all this is a separate lecture that Tom's going to be giving. So you're going to hear about what to do about all this. Stay shortly. tuned. All right, what's the most common mistake you see being made when you get a DIC TTP consult? So I think the most common mistake is, one of them is people don't think about it. And so I'll be asked about thrombocytopenia. Uh, I, I think people sometimes get locked into their diagnosis too early. And so my most vivid case I remember was being called, oh, we have this alcoholic and encephalopathic look at the smear, schistocytes everywhere. So I really think the biggest mistake is not thinking about it. Because if you think about it, you can run through the mental list in your mind. Boom, get it done. Again, I think in DIC, sometimes people get too wrapped up. We got to find the exact cause. You know, most of the time it's obvious. If it isn't still treat the DIC, as we'll talk about later, and something will filter out. But I think especially with TTP, that when I see people get burned, it's more not thinking about it or at least having it go through your mind. And so you'd rather people err on the side of thinking about it and potentially getting you folks involved yes. than not considering right, it. Right, right. I, I always hate to be called in late. I'd rather say, Glad you thought about it. No, the LDH is normal, blah, blah, blah. Instead of like, why didn't you consult us three days ago? Fantastic. Round of applause, Tom DeLore. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you.